Welcome, everyone. Um, it's my uh, real privilege and honor to introduce General McConville, uh, who is the 47th uh, Deputy uh, Chief of Staff of the Army. Uh, he is a graduate of West Point. Uh, he also did an MA in Aerospace Engineering at Georgia Tech. He was a security fellow at Harvard uh, in 2002. He uh, served a couple of tours in Afghanistan, also in Iraq. Uh, previous uh, jobs in the Army have included being Director of Personnel. He also commanded the 101st and, and, uh, at Fort Campbell. Uh, so he's had a, a great deal of experience in the military, and uh, he's agreed to have a conversation uh, for about half an hour, and then we'll open up to your questions. Uh, when you ask questions, uh, hopefully you will identify yourself and wait for the, for the microphone, and also General McConville can't address policy uh, directly, obviously. Uh, so just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that. Uh, so General McConville, um, a, a personal question, which is you have uh, three children who are serving. Um, and that, uh, what are the, does that make other problems about having a military that is increasingly becoming kind of a hereditary occupation? Um, and are there strengths in that? What are the, what are the pros and cons? Well, I, I think, I think the strengths is uh, we have a lot of uh, senior officers who have children serving the military. So when we make decisions, uh, that's certainly in, in the back of our minds. And, and we know that parents sent their most important assets to the Army and the military. And I think we always keep that back in our mind. This is someone's son or daughter that we're sending into combat. This is someone's son or daughter that we're sending off to do this mission. And we, we need to make sure we do that. Having said that, 79% uh, of, of the people that come in the Army uh, have a family member that served uh, in the military, and we want to open that up. We don't want to become isolated. You know, we have gated communities right now because of security, and I think it's very, very important uh, that we represent the, the, the total diversity of the United States and America, and, and we, we, we aim to do that. How do you keep uh, the military, I mean, the experience of being in the military um, is not common anymore in a way that it was not true 50 years ago. How do you ensure that your um, leaders are uh, exposed to the civilian world and learning about the civilian world and, and are comfortable with working in that world because at a certain point, they're gonna to have to deal with that world? You know, I think I had the opportunity to, we, we send um, many of our officers to, to graduate school, civilian graduate schools, we like to do that so they get a chance to um, go to school with, with civilians, and I had a chance to go to Georgia Tech, which was a great opportunity, uh, tactical-wise, and I had a chance to go to Harvard, and so we try to send our uh, officers uh, with the most potential to those type programs so they have a chance to interact uh, with the civilian counterparts uh, as we go forward. We also do a lot of things about education, inviting um, leaders to our posts, influence to our posts, teachers to our posts, so they get an idea of why someone may want to serve in the military. Uh, it really is a great opportunity, and unless you have an opportunity to meet um, some of the people that serve, you'll, you'll never really get, get that opportunity to understand. Uh, I mean, there was a time when going off to graduate school as an army officer might even have been a penalty on your career. Is that not the case anymore? Well, I, I look at the chief of staff of the army. He went off to Columbia for graduate school. I went to graduate school, so um, there's always, um, certainly some tension between how much field time you get and how much education, and we're trying to find that, that, that right balance as we go forward. So General Milley, the Chief of Staff of the Army, and yourself have um, sort of set up this new uh, Futures Command. Right. Well, what is the purpose of that, and, and, and why was it necessary? Sure, I, you know, there's a, the, the old cliche is that you know, generals are always trying to fight the last war, and, and quite frankly, we're not. Uh, we're, we're trying to win the next one and we're, we're looking around uh, in the world, and we find ourselves at an inflection point. Uh, for the last uh, 16 years, uh, we've been fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq, primarily uh, doing counterinsurgency, uh, counterterrorism type operations, and we just had a new uh, national defense strategy come out and talk about great power competition, and not necessarily that we're gonna go to war with great power competition, but we, as a military, we need to be ready. And so we need to change the way we do business. The civilian um, industry, as far as when it comes to technology, has moved very, very quickly. So we need to adapt our in industrial age processes so we can quickly uh, modernize the military as we go forward. 
And it's a matter of public record that some of the de defense systems that you need to modernize are communications networks that work amid heavy jamming, better defenses against drones, next generation combat vehicles, including unmanned. I mean, can you, can you say something about those systems? Sure, and, and you know, as we you know, look into the future, our priorities that we've laid out are, 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 are um, very relevant, you know, long range precision fires. Uh, we want to be able to outrange and out gun any of our future uh, adversaries as we go forward. Uh, our, we've got you know, the world's greatest tanks right now, but as we look into the future, we're gonna need a next generation combat vehicle uh, that may be robotic, it may be autonomous. Uh, same thing as we look to our future vertical lift. Uh, we want a mesh network uh, that's gonna allow us to communicate in a contested environment. Uh, air and missile defense, we're very concerned about unmanned aerial systems. And then uh, for us, the, the lethality of the soldier is, is also very important. You mentioned autonomous. I mean, how autonomous might these systems be? Because of course, there's a kind of a discussion about keeping humans in the loop. Yeah, I think, I, I think there's always gonna be a person in the loop. Yeah. Um, there just may not be a person in the lead aircraft or lead vehicle uh, as we go into harm's way. But I, I, I think you know, the, the nature of war is such that it's, it's always gonna be uh, a battle of human wills, at least in the near future as we look forward. But we look to areas like with artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning uh, as a situation that can help our, our soldiers in the battlefield and our adversaries are, are looking in those areas and we tend to look in the same area. The Chinese did a demonstration of, you know, like more than 100 drones come with all sort of operated with AI that seems pretty autonomous relatively recently. I mean, so, I mean, even if we keep somebody in the loop or want to keep somebody in the loop, uh, it seems like our adversaries are moving past that. I mean, what's your sort of thinking on that? Well, yeah, we're certainly gonna be able to counter uh, their advantages. We're very aware about what some of our adversaries may be doing in the science and technology area, and that's why uh, we're moving out very quickly. That's why we're establishing the future command. So we are much more uh, agile and we are much quicker in getting after these technologies. You used to work at SOCOM and the Futures Command is sort of based on the SOCOM acquisition system. Give us a little bit more detail about how that's gonna work. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really about um, developing very quickly. As we, as we look around, it, it's almost what we call develop and then operationalize, buy, uh, you know, try before we buy, uh, get out with the industry and, and rather, the way we operate right now is we'll spend three to five years trying to get the requirements for a future uh, system exactly right. And by the time we get the requirements right and turn over to our acquisition core, maybe five to seven years, uh, before we actually field the equipment. So now we're at 12, 15 years, and you know, we're trying to you know, uh, field the iPhone 1, and me meanwhile, <laughs> industry has gone out and we've got the iPhone 10, so we know we have to be much, much quicker and, and, and as we go forward, and that's what we're trying to do. The other thing we've learned is for innovation, and we're looking for discipline innovation, is to bring uh, industry and in all walks of industry, not just the defense uh, companies to say, hey, we got a problem. How can you help us solve the problem? Let them come back with ideas and prototypes and we'll get it out to soldiers and we'll try it and then we'll quickly uh, downsize and down select and get that, get that moving into a program of record. Another innovation is the security force assistant brigades. What are those and why are they necessary? Yeah, we, we've been advising and assisting for the last 16 years, but we never had a force to do that. And you know, as we go in the future, uh, we, we look at that you know, we, we basically want to give our allies the opportunities to secure themselves. And in Afghanistan, we recognized that we were taking brigades of infantry and basically breaking them up so we could provide advisors um, to go forward. And we did that when I was commander 101st. So what we decided to do was actually we would develop a force, make that force focused on being uh, advisors and then send them forward. We have our first security force assistance brigade uh, in Afghanistan right now. And you served two tours in Afghanistan. What, did you, what, what are your big takeaways? I mean, we were there you know, 17 years later. Um, what, you were there in 08, 09, and then 13, 14. What were the differences that you saw? Yeah, I, I would say when I was there in 2008, 2009, that uh, we were doing most of the fighting. Uh, the, the Afghan security forces were just brand new developing uh, when my, um, um, when our successes came back, uh, they were partnered uh, with the Afghan security forces. They were much better. When I came back uh, a few years later, uh, the Afghan security forces were in a position to actually take the lead for security. And today they, they are the, taking the primary lead. They certainly are taking more casualties than they did before, but 
Uh, they are responsible for the security of, of Afghanistan. And what we're trying to do is, is give them the assistance they need so they can continue to progress uh, where they're, with their forces so they take less casualties and we can get to some type of political solution. You also served in, in Iraq in a kind of urban environment. 90% of the world, up to 90% of the world will live in cities by the middle of the century. What implications does that have for what you do, for what the army does, and, and the future army? Well, I think, um, you know, we, we, we fought uh, some pretty heavy battles in, in, in Baghdad, Sardis City, uh, in Fallujah, in um, Najaf. And, and what we learned is we're not going to bypass cities because that's where the people are. We're going to have to be able to operate in dense urban terrain. And, and it brings a lot of challenges uh, that we need to develop equipment to. We need to develop tactics and, 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 um, and, and concepts so we can do that. And that's part of the things that we're doing right now. You're also a, ma a master aviator, um, and obviously in Mosul, it was a very dense urban environment. Um, ISIS was dug in amongst civilians. I mean, what are, what are the lessons learned from uh, a situation like Mosul? Well, all, all cities are, are very difficult fights because uh, we, we, we go in with a mindset uh, that we're going to do all we can to protect the civilian population there. And some of our adversaries don't. They actually use... Uh, civilians as shields, they put them in harm's way, and uh, I've seen many, many a soldier in combat that put themselves in harm's way because they did not want to um, go after an enemy that was hiding behind civilians as we go forward. So we got to work out the tactics, techniques, and procedures to do that, and, and we're doing that as we speak. What does that look like in terms of training for that? I mean, how do you train for yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, what we have, what we've built is we have urban training device, or urban um, training sites at all our um, combat training centers, they're, they're not of a, you know, it's hard to build a, you know, 15 million uh, person city to do that. <laughs> um, but we are training on the techniques. We're training, we have the capability to go underground uh, and, and work those situations. But the other thing we're working to, f forward to is, or we're working on right now is with um, virtual reality. We can do a lot mm -hmm. of things. It's amazing when you see, uh, and, and this is how, you know, get, get a little out of the box. You start deal, dealing with uh, civilian, um, industry who's doing a whole bunch of stuff in the gaming industry. And, and, and we are going after that virtual reality. You basically can get inside um, a, a, a gaming type situation that's very realistic. So we can train our soldiers as they were actually in that city or in that place as we go forward without building that entire city, without transporting our soldiers there. So we see um, that environment is something that we're, we're, we're going to get after in the future. My guess is the success of our organization to ISIS will also use these tools, perhaps, for their training, right, virtually? I mean, other adversaries will also use this. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. You know, and that's why we, we need to be quick. I mean, this gets back to Futures Command. We, we have yeah. to turn very, very quickly because our adversaries are doing the same. Uh, you said that for the past half century, the Army um, was only contested on land, and now the army will be contested in every domain. What did you mean, and, and what does that mean for the military of the future? Yeah, it's, you know, I was just doing a little history, and uh, we, we got a great Air Force, and the last time an American soldier was killed by an enemy aircraft was April 15th, 1953. So we really haven't been contested uh, in the air. The last time a Navy ship was sunk by another, or by an enemy was 1945. And so, mm. as we look at the world, uh, we've been able to pretty much move our troops uh, into countries we need to go, move our equipment into the countries by, by sea. Uh, we've certainly been contested on the land and, and somewhat uh, in the air, but we look as we go in the future, we'll be contested in all domains. So we're certainly going to be contested on, on the land. We need to, uh, we're bringing back air defense such, uh, units because we're, we, we think we'll be contested by enemy air or, or by drones or some type of aerial systems. And, you know, we're very concerned about cyber and we're very concerned about space because how dependent we've become on those, those domains. And, um, I mean, speaking of dependency, um, when information technology is ubiquitous in the force and somehow an adversary is able to interfere with that, I mean, how do you train people to not be dependent overly dependent on GPS and, and other technology. Well, it's, you know, I, I, I joke for, you know, I, I try to tell some of the, the younger officers and NCOs, we used to have these paper things called maps, <laughs> and we had things called compasses, and that's how we got to navigate, and, and now everyone has a phone. I mean, if you think about the agility that we get from GPS and move map displays, you know, no one has a map in their car anymore. You know, if you got, go somewhere, you just type it in, you quickly get there, and, and that, in, in combat, it works the same way. 
You know, the ability at night to, to, to maneuver forces to a target um, is it, just unbelievable. So what we have to do and what we're doing is building resilient systems that are going to allow us to operate uh, in that environment. We're also training our, our pilots and, and our ground crews that when they don't have that, those systems, how do, you, how do you operate? And we're building tactics, techniques, and procedures to do that also. Women are increasingly moving into combat units. What, I mean, what's the scale of that? Uh, what does the future look like? How is this happening? Yeah, I'm, I'm really proud. I have a daughter that serves in the military, and I, I'm just really proud of uh, what women are doing for the country. I, I want to put in perspective, we have 170,000 women serving in the Army. 170,000. If you know that, that's almost the size of the Marine Corps. Mm. And make an incredible contribution. You know, 70,000 in the active Army. We have women, um, 10 women that graduated from Ranger School, which is our toughest school, and uh, very, very impressive. Uh, we have ranges, I and mean, we have uh, women commanding uh, company in the 82nd Airborne Division, Infantry Company. We have women in every single infantry, armor, artillery battalion, and every single brigade combat team in the Army right now as we speak. So it's, it's very, very impressive. We have over 600 women uh, that are in the infantry, in the armor as we go forward. And you know, I think, you know, where does this end up? Um, I think when we stop keeping track of the percentages, then we probably hit the right point. And I think we're getting towards that thing. Um, you have 180,000 um, army personnel deployed around the world. I mean, you know, that, that's a large number uh, when you know only 15,000 roughly are serving in the war in Afghanistan. What is everybody else doing, and, and what does that mean about the future of the army? They're, they're just not hanging around. No, they're pretty yeah. busy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you, when you think about you know what an army does, it, it really deters um, other folks' behavior. And so, you know, when I when I first came in the army. Uh, we had 250,000 soldiers in Europe deter Russian aggression, or so, at the time of Soviet Union aggression. So we still have, we still have soldiers um, in Europe and in a, in a fairly good amount of soldiers deterring uh, that type of um, aggression that may happen, and our partners want us there. Uh, we have soldiers uh, in Korea that are deterring that type of aggression, and they certainly want us there. We have soldiers all over the Middle East and, and, and most of um, what our soldiers are doing is, is just re reassuring our, our allies and, and partners that, that will be there with them and deterring um, situations bef before they get out of control. You mentioned Korea. I mean, obviously, uh, without getting into the policy question, what is, if, if it did come to war, what, what would that look like, do you think? Well, you know, a lot of people just describe just how horrific uh, uh, that situation would be. If you've been to Korea, Seoul's, you know, 15, 20 million people, not that far from the border, uh, a lot of artillery uh, that could be used in those type of things. But um, yeah, I, I think that um, our adversaries need to understand that we have a, a, a very strong military that will do what it needs to do uh, in those situations. And, and our military is ready to do what it needs to do. And hopefully uh, a ready military will get folks to the to the, um, the table and they can you know, let the diplomacy take its, its path. Um, a number of, our, of American adversaries, ISIS, Hezbollah, Russian proxies in Ukraine use sort of hybrid warfare, some combination of conventional terrorism, information operations. I mean, how do you, how do you fight an enemy that's uh, doing that? Um, how do you prepare for that um, in the future? Yeah, we, the, the way we prepare is, is we've got to be strong everywhere. So we, we're, we're certainly watching what our potential adversaries are doing. Uh, we kind of look at, you know, uh, best of breed, what, what type of capability do they have in each of these areas, and we want to get that type of overmatch as we go forward. So if they're using some type of drones, we want to make sure we can cut those drones. Not only can we cut them, we can cut them at a cost uh, that's going to um, – cause them not to want to go down that road. If they're coming after us with cyber, we want to make sure we have the ability to impose a cost on them if they choose to, to come after us in that area. How do we, um, I mean, it seems that if you look historically, uh, you're a graduate of West Point, uh, I think 81, class of 81. Were you? Yes, yes. Um, so, um, you know, the army, the military in general tends to want to fight the war that it's going to win. So, you know, Saddam Hussein was perfect because it was in the desert and he had tanks and, you know, the, the, the battle lasted. But, you know, history keeps presenting things that don't, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq. So how do you prevent, how do you, A, keep the lessons learned and B, not fall into this kind of default mode of, well, we're just, you know, there'll be tank battles in 
uh, some green field in Eastern Europe? Yeah, I think uh, that's a good question. I, I think, you know, a lot of times we talk about the future, we're talking about technology and the type of systems we need and the material solutions. And to us, I, I think it's a lot more important uh, to focus on, on the people. And I would say, argue that in the Army, people are our most important asset. Um, we're doing a lot in talent management. Mm. And a lot, you know, if you, if you, if you study, you know, if you, you study the Germans before World War II, you know, people talk about uh, Blitzkrieg and, and, and the fact that they had radios and they had tanks, but it was really the leaders they had that they developed that were able to take that technology and apply it in a way that, that you know, initially made them uh, very successful. And so as we go in the future, we, we need uh, leaders that can operate in, in different type environments, and we have to develop those leaders, that, and then we enable them with technology so they can be successful in the battlefield. These, I mean, this, for instance, the Security Forces System Brigade, it, it sounds, it, I know it's different from Green Beret Special Forces, but I mean, it sounds like, is the Army sort of moving more into this sort of like special forceization model? Well, you know, first of all, they, they wear brown berets. <laughs> okay. We had to, yeah. so you know, <laughs> ask that question. They do, they're not wearing green berets. And, you know, it's, it's really share of the task on the battlefield. Uh, they, they, you know, we have great Special Forces. Uh, they have done incredible things. If you go to Afghanistan, you just take a look at the commando forces that, uh, our special forces and in, 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 um, in our coalition partners developed, they are doing extremely well. But I, I would argue that what conventional forces and an advise and assist capacity bring is they, they bring the capability to develop an institutional army, which you need if you're going to be responsible and run a country. I mean, the, the Afghans know how to fight. They, we don't need to teach them how to fight. They've been doing it a long time and they know how to do it very, very well. What they haven't done in, in over the years is develop a professional army that is uh, going to be institutionalized and that's what our advised and assist brigades are helping them do is develop a professional conventional army that knows how to do logistics that knows how to do artillery that knows how to you know do uh, medical evacuation in the battlefield all those skill sets they need that are just not the fighting part is there a danger of sort of a uh it's sort of imposing the American way of war on them. I mean, is there, how do you kind of adjust for local circumstances? Well, we have to, we have to be very, very careful uh, about as we go forward. And, and that's why we do a lot of cultural training uh, with, with the forces as they go forward. And, and the other uh, thing is just that the notion of how we advise and assist as, as Americans, we tend to want to take the lead. And for some of our soldiers, we have to train them that you are, you know, really over the shoulder, you know, position to help. Uh, but, but let the, let, let our, um, coalition partners figure out the right way to do it. So the Iraqi counterterrorism service uh, and the Iraqi army writ large, I mean, what are the, obviously that went pretty well. How, what, are, what are the lessons learned from that and um, for the future? I, I think what I've, what I've learned in, in, in our advising and having watched uh, the 82nd uh, do it, uh, in fact, one of the uh, brigade commanders, one of my battalion commanders, uh, Pat Work, who they did a very, very good job of, of capitalizing on the strengths of the force that they were advising. They didn't do it for them. There's a tendency to want to do things for the force that you're advising. Uh, what you really want to do is, is take a step back and, you know, use a cliche, you don't want to be a helicopter parent, like, you know, raising kids. You want to give them an opportunity to do it the way they want to do it. And if they need help, you, you help them when they need it, but you give them the chance to do it themselves. You give them the, the enablers that allow them to win in the battlefield. And I think that's the best way ahead. Thank you, sir. We'll open it up to questions. If you have a question, uh, wait for the mic and identify yourself. Uh, thank you. Okay. Stunned into. Wow, great. <laughs> Testing. Yeah, just a little Thank bit. Thank you. Uh, Chris from the BBC. Yeah. Hear me now. Um, you've also talked about the credibility of Jerry Moore's career. Um, I would assume one of the questions of credibility would be. How about now? Oh. I think we can. Hear Apologies. <laughs> uh, once again, Chris Wolf from the BBC. You talked about the um, uh, importance of the credibility of the deterrent for North Korea. I would ask one of the questions about credibility would be um, stabilization in a post-conflict world. Does the US have the manpower? Can it get the allies to provide the manpower to 
credibly stabilize North Korea in a post-conflict world? Well, I, th I think that's a good question. I think um, you know, anytime you go to war, uh, you need to be ready for what happens afterwards. And uh, you know, from where we sit, what we want to do is the best way to deter a war is be prepared for war. And, and we, are, we are prepared to do those type things. And you know, the other thing is you got to take a look at South, South Korea is a very modern country with a lot of capability. And you know, it's their country as we go forward, and we'll certainly be prepared to assist them. The, the military has a lot of experience now in phase four operations, right? Arguably uh, more than a decade and a half. I mean, right. what, are the, um, what are the big lessons uh, of those operations? Yeah, as I, I, I think you know, one of the critical things that has to happen after any type of conflict is to establish security first. You, you have to get security, and really you have to establish security um, by um, the, the local uh, you know, local people have to be responsible for their security. And the quicker we do that, and if we don't have an idea of how that's going to be established or how that's going to happen, uh, then we need, need to think our way through that. But, but that's, you know, if, to get everything else going, if you don't have security, you're going to have problems all the way through. So uh, somehow you've got to establish a security force. You've got to have some type of army to protect the, the country. You've got to have a police force. You've got to get those things going. Then you actually need a bureaucracy. You know, we always, you know, kind of joke about, you know, uh, bureaucracies. But... Um, you need one, and, and some of these countries don't have good government bureaucracies, and you need to get one going so you can actually start doing the things that people want you to do. Because I mean, all people are the same. They, they, you know, they want their kids to go to school, they want to have good jobs, and they want to have an opportunity for prosperity. And what we have to do is set the conditions for that to happen. I mean, does it, at an army war college now, are you being taught that you might have to be effectively the district governor? Of, well, we do. You know, it, it, again, you know, we, we want to hand that over as, as soon as possible. But part of, part of talent management is, is how we use the forces we have. And, and, you know, if you take a look at our reserve and guard forces, um, we have tremendous talent um, inside those organizations. And what we want to do is make sure we can get after it. So we're actually changing our personnel system to a talent management system. And I'll give you an example. When, I, when, I was, uh, when we were in Afghanistan in 2008-2009, um, you know, we're trying to develop the economy and we're trying to do all those type of things. And so we, we asked our Guard and Reserve Forces what they actually did in real life. You know, mm. I mean, they're all soldiers, but what do you do? Well, you know, we found out we had the head of the Texas Highway Department, so that person certainly could help us build roads. Um, a lot of um, Afghanistan is agriculture. And, you know, I'm a kid from Boston. I've seen <laughs> pictures of farms, so I have no <laughs> idea, you know, how that actually works. But, but we had people from, you know, states that, you know, for, were professional farmers. And so we could help them, you know, but, you know, the assist, the help, what we don't want to do is do it for people. You know, if you mm -hmm. study any histories of insurgency, those type things, if we end up doing it for the people of the country, we're never going to get, they'll, they'll let us do it. You know, if I'm willing to mow your lawn every weekend, you'll let me do it, right? <laughs> so, not these people have lawns, but if they did, we would we, go on that way. So that's what I think the future is, is, is how we get them back in charge, give them the security, and, and let them um, move forward uh, as we go, as soon as we can. Jen Easterly. Uh, Jen Easterly, thanks for your remarks, General, okay. and uh, for your service. You talked a lot about people uh, and talent management, but then uh, to your point, about 79% are folks that have um, relatives that are in the Army. I guess two questions. First, what are you doing um, about the recruiting piece to sort of widen that tent specifically? Yeah. And then secondly, you also talked about the importance of forging relationships with industry um, and with uh, the private sector. So what are you thinking about in terms of opportunities and personnel policies that allow uh, people to go back and forth more easily than we yeah. have now. Because working in the cyber business, I think it would be fantastic if we were able to enable people doing cyber in the Army to come and do a critical infrastructure uh, type entity and then go back again. No, I, that's, I, that's a great, I mean, that's a great question. And that's really precisely what we're trying to do. Um, we're actually putting in a system. It's an integrated personnel and pay system. But right now we have an, an, an industrial-based type system. So we, we manage people by really two variables. You're a captain of infantry or you're a sergeant of engineers. And we have three different personnel systems for our National Guard, for our reserve, and for our active. So it, it, it doesn't really allow you to go back and forth the way we want to do. So we recognize that. And you know, as we go in the future, we want, we want a system that is going to manage 
each person's individual talent. So rather than you being defined by maybe two variables, we're going to define you by 25 variables. And we're going to credential you in a way that you're a person of cyber that has this skill level. We can bring you into the Army. We can allow you to serve. We can promote you based on that skill level and not necessarily how many combat tours you have or how many um, you know, live fire events you've done, because we, we recognize the future. We're going to need different types of people in the Army. And the, the thing on, the, on uh, coming after civilian, what we're really trying to do is expose, we, we need to expose the Army more to people. You know, the re there's a reason why, you know, kids of military officers and NCOs go in the Army, because they know it. But, you know, I, I grew up in Boston. There was very little military around. You know, if, if we had a few kids in the neighborhood uh, going to service, mainly because their dads were enlisted during the Korean War or during World War II. And if you don't have that anymore, then how will people, you know, know what's going on as we go forward? So we've, we've got to do that. The other thing on recruiting is, only 29% of American youth are qualified to come in the military. And because so that, they're too overweight? Uh, it's, it's for a whole bunch, it's a whole yeah. bunch of reasons, but, but you think about that, to enlist in the United States Army today, only 29% of youth are qualified. Wow. And we're competing for those you know, extraordinary young men and women like everyone else is, and so we're trying to open up the aperture. We don't, we don't want to be just a, a family business or a military business, we want to give everyone the opportunity to serve because, you know, s someday, you know, somewhere someone's going to ask them what they did, you know, after a country was attacked and, you know, I, you, you look at veterans, take a look at veterans, where they go when they're older, you know, they, they come back and very, very proud of the service. So we want to give everyone an opportunity to be proud of the service. Just to follow up on Jen's question, so this yeah. cyber expert who's promoted on his or her expertise in cyber, I mean, could he or she then take two years of Morgan Stanley to work with Jen, and that would not be penalized, a matter that would penalize their career and then come back. Yeah, we do, we do have some programs that do that. We send, you know, but we need to do a better job. So we, we, we do, what we have is internships with training with industry. So we can send you over to train with industry. We can, we can bring you back. We do have National Guard and reservists who are, you know, work traditional on weekends. They're in, some, but what we need is a better system to allow us to, to bring the whole team together. And, and, and do it in more of a seamless way as we go forward. So, and that's what we intend to do over the next couple of years. This gentleman here, third row. General Chris Miller from the Air Force Academy. Uh, do you see a, a common, uh, common vision among the services and, and do you see a willingness in the Congress to modify law and policy to do the kinds of things you just, just described? Well, I, I think we, we're seeing um, a, a common vision. We, we talk about multi-domain operations and multi-domain battles. So each of the services are looking from their perspective and they see a, a lot of mutual interests in moving forward in this thing. So I think that is happening. Uh, there, there is concerns about you know how fast we go because we you know it, there's a lot of interest when you change the acquisition system and um, I would say we've disrupted it right now in the army and there's certainly a lot of concerns about how we're going to do this but I, I think we have to we've got to show success we've got to show that we're being good stewards of of the money that we're getting from Congress and I think once we show that and prove that and put the right controls in place we're going to have a better opportunity to move forward on this. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I, I think, you know, what I was working very close with the Congress, I mean, I mean, they want to do the same thing we want to do. They want to feel the best force. And there's, there's always, you know, if they're going to put legislation in place, what, the, what they want us to do is take a look at the legislation we have right now. And, you know, we, we are an up or out military. Uh, there's a reason why we do that. Some people complain about that, but, you know, it goes back to uh, before World War II when we were not. And they used to, the big joke was that the, you know there was so much dead wood around the War Department it was a fire hazard you know so we, we changed the system. Now the fact it's up or out, um, what we want to do is get people that perform and stay too with the right skill sets and the right talents and it's the nuance of how we do that as we go forward. With because I, again I argue you know we've got industrial age processes both for talent management it's really personnel management it's industrial age and i think we got industrial age processes for acquisition i think we need to change both that's what we're trying to do joel garrow from asu Thank you. uh joel garrow weaponized narrative initiative arizona state you mentioned uh, uh operating in the cyber domain and you talked about uh imposing a cost against anybody how would you envision doing that 
Well, I, I, got, I got a whole bunch of ways I can envision. Um, <laughs> Well, you're talking about, co I'm not going to get into actually methods, but here's the deal. If someone does something to us, they should, you know, they, they should be uh, deterred by what may happen back to them. And if, if they think they can do anything they want and never pay a cost, they will continue to do those type things. And we will see some of the most horrific things uh, that happen as we go forward. We'll see people using chemical weapons. We'll see a lot of people doing things that, quite frankly, are immoral, unethical, and illegal, and I don't think we should let them do it. Well, again, I'm not going to get into the policy things. I'm, you know, my, my job is really to provide best military advice, and that's what we intend to do as we go forward. But but it, it is developing capabilities, and you know, there, there's you know, there's there's a lot of competition, if you want to call it, below the level of war going on, and. You know, we need to be highly competitive in these areas, and so some of the technologies we're looking at and some of the capabilities we have is, is, is certainly um, very competitive uh, with our adversaries, and, and what we want to do is continue the overmatch so we, you know, we get to the, the level of deterrence that we need to have. My understanding is West Point started sort of as an engineering school to a large degree. It did, yeah. So should it be reconceptualized as sort of a cyber warfare, cyber information? I mean, the, the, maybe that's already happening, but... Well, it is. I mean, it, 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 it's interesting to watch even how we send people to school. Um, you know, when I was going to graduate school, you had to go into hard science. So I, I went into aerospace engineering. I really wanted an MBA, but they said that's not going to happen. Hmm. Even being an economics undergrad, they said you're still going to aerospace engineering. And that was exciting at Georgia Tech. But what we want to do, and, and then we started sending people for you know, some of the softest type sciences. What we're seeing right now is young men and women are very interested in going cyber. So when we, 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 our branches are competitive. So some branches are very, very competitive. And our top students coming out of uh, West Point in, in engineering and going to cyber, our top students coming out of ROTC are going to cyber. And you know, we're doing something, we have some authorities within cyber where you can come directly into the military, just like our medical and legal folks. And, and, and mm -hmm. we're working that as we go forward. We're, we're, the Secretary of the Army and, and, and we have stood up a, a talent management task force and the person that's actually gonna run it is uh, J.P. McGee and he's coming from cyber. He's, a, you know, he's a, um, uh, an operator, but he's coming out of cyber command. And that's why we're having that type of person that's, so we can be a little more innovative uh, as we bring this, People like cyber into the force. Any other questions? This gentleman here. Hi, Tim Sveis, the Higgs Center for Strategic Studies. I was wondering whether you could elaborate a little on your vision for the future of the Army in, let's say, 2025, in terms of the integration of unmanned. We know of some countries that have announced their ambition to have, by 2025, 30% of their unmanned forces, of their forces to be unmanned platforms. This very week in the Netherlands, where I come from, I shook the hand of the, the first commander of the first RAS unit, Robotics and Unmanned Systems. His unit only consists of two, him and one robot. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> it, it gives him... Yeah. So I, I was wondering uh, w w you know, about your vision for... Him. No, I think um, y you know, we first started experimenting with man-unman teaming uh, in, in Iraq. Uh, and you know, when you're flying over cities, you know, at least you know, you personally learn that it's much better to have an unmanned aerial system up there getting shot at than having a manned system. So um, we've done a lot of work um, on unmanned systems on the aerial side. Uh, we have some type of robotics on the ground side, but I think as you look in the future, uh, at least our vision is we're not going to put manned vehicles or manned aircraft into situations at the tip of the spear uh, where the enemy threat is, is the largest. So, you know, we, we are looking very much at that. Uh, you know, if you think about the spectrum, you got manned, you kind of have semi-autonomous or remote, and then you have autonomous, basically, you know, completely unmanned where the system kind of flies itself. We used to all be over here, and we're slowly moving to where we have, you know, remote systems that, um, especially on the aerial side, they, they are pretty much not flown. You know, they're almost, they're almost computer-aided, you know. Uh, when we first started flying unmanned aerial systems, there was a pilot on the ground, you know, just basically flying it just like you would an aircraft. Well, with, you know, this, the, 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 um, the IT capability we have right now, it's more like, you know, operating computer as we go forward. And once we get into more of the machine learning 
and artificial intelligence, then we're going to have the capability to do a lot different type things. But you're going to see a lot more of the, the unmanned, even unmanned teaming uh, as we go forward, both on the air and the ground. And that's where our technology is going. But I still believe there'll always be a person to loop. They just may not be in the lead aircraft or the lead vehicle. George Nicholson. Sir, George Nicholson with the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. Years and years ago, and I'm dating myself, General Gorman, when he was a Southcom commander, said, we've got a great propensity of hanging the millstone of technology around our partners' necks, things they can't afford to buy, they can't afford to maintain, they can't afford to operate. I remember talking to the J3 uh, in Honduras. He said, I don't need 47 echoes. I don't need terrain following terrain avoidance radar. I've got pilots who've got 20,000 flying hours. They know this area like the back of their hands. What are you looking at in terms of uh, working with our partners out there, getting them something that they can afford to maintain, operate, and? No, that's a, that's a great point. I, I learned that as a young officer um, in, in, in Central and South America where, you know, just like you said, we, you know, we, we'd come in and, I mean, there's a, there's a tendency to say, hey, we, we need to give folks the best equipment. What, what's, what you want to do is give them the equipment that they can actually use and they can maintain mm. and they can train on and they can afford. And, you know, quite frankly, we're, we're doing the same thing at, at our level. We want to make sure that the equipment we buy is not exquisite. It's something that we can afford uh, as we go down in the future because there is, you know, there is a tendency, you know, you talked about where we got one person, one robot, you know. Um, you know, if you buy an acquisitive system, you may only have one robot, you know, and, and mass matters on the Army. Uh, and so as, as we look in, into the future, the, you know, we, don't, we can't rely on technology because someone's going to take it away from you. So simple systems that are inexpensive is kind of our approach as we go forward. This gentleman here. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, first, I would like to thank you and congratulate you for uh, the great job you are doing, uh, the United States is doing in leading and operating the coalition uh, in Iraq. Uh, my question is that uh, while the, uh, the operation Inherent Resolve reaches its uh, uh, final stages, uh, at least the major operations, and moving to a stabilizing uh, stage, uh, uh, what should we do to uh, avoid uh, repeating the previous scenarios where the U.S. <coughs> uh, did a great job and uh, eliminated Al-Qaeda, uh, and then we had uh, another uh, rebel, uh, terror group uh, resurfaced, uh, especially uh, when it comes to the uh, borders uh, and how can uh, the U.S. help Iraq in securing uh, its borders with uh, Syria, for example, uh, where Iraq uh, had always uh, the, the problem of uh, uh, terrorist and uh, armed groups uh, crossing the uh, borders to the country. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as everywhere else, we want Iraq to be able to secure its own borders and secure its own country. And, and I think that's the discussion that's going on right now, how this will be stabilized, what forces will stay, what will not. Uh, I'm sure that General Votel and, um, will make a recommendation to the Joint Chiefs and Secretary Mattis, and they will come up with a plan and we'll actually figure out how we're going to do this. Well, I want to thank General McConville for a very illuminating set of uh, remarks very much. And thank you. You're a very busy man, and we're grateful that you came. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me.